All right, so for this week, I decided to work on a landing pose animation and make a tutorial on how I made this character animation in particular. Before I get into it, I want to let you know that the Akali rig I'm using in this exercise is available for free for all who want to use her thanks to the Agora animation community. Click the link in the description below to download her. One more thing to note about this rig is that her hair and accessories are rigged to move on their own according to the animation, meaning you won't have to animate the follow through and overlapping actions on those items if you'd rather keep them automatic. So I won't be getting into the follow through and overlapping actions in this video. Bouncing Ball Blocking Before doing any kind of animation with the character rig, I think it's very important to fill out the animation with a bouncing ball first. What I mean by that is that you want to get a sense of the spacing and timing of the character. The bouncing ball represents the character's torso. Think of sketching a drawing before doing any kind of final line work. By animating a bouncing ball first, you get to work much faster and therefore get to be much more experimental with how you want the animation to be driven. You don't even need a bouncing ball rig either, you just add a UV sphere to the scene and move its origin point to the bottom of the sphere, so that when you scale it down, it scales down from the bottom, rather than the center. This keeps the ball planted on the floor when being squashed down. And that's it, you start placing the ball where the character should be and start experimenting with the timing and spacing. Eventually, that'll translate to the final character animation. Just keep one thing in mind though, even though you're done with this stage, know that the animation you've just done with the bouncing ball is still preliminary. It's a solid blueprint, but like anything else, it's never truly final. Key Poses Once your bouncing ball blocking is set up, you can start placing the character's position through its torso bone or cog, center of gravity controller, according to the bouncing ball. Once that's done and you've got that set up, it's time to start posing your character's key poses. These are the most important poses because they relate to the viewer the main actions and intentions of your character. Think of a character's posing in a comic book. They're mostly all key poses. One thing you do not want to do is doing your key poses without any reference. They are a time saver and they provide good guidelines like line of action, the limbs placement, and the weight distribution of the torso. Those can sound obvious but can be easy to miss. Even if you can't find a reference online, pose your idea in front of the camera and use yourself as a reference. For my animation, the main poses were her falling down, which is a stretch, the landing, which is based on the superhero landing, which is a squash, and her final pose giving her some personality. It's very important to make sure that your interpolation mode is set to constant, also named stepped. This means that there is no interpolation done by Blender between your poses. You can achieve this by selecting all of your keys in the timeline, press shortcut T to toggle the interpolation menu, and select constant. Extreme and breakdown poses. Once you've settled on your key poses, it's time to add another layer of detail to your animation. In this case, extreme and breakdown poses. They'll further elaborate your animation and provide a much better sense of your spacing and timing. Remember when talking about the bouncing ball blocking stage potentially being adjusted? It's usually at this stage that this starts. The timing and spacing might change now that you're animating a full character rig with limbs, hair, and accessories rather than just a bouncing ball. Extreme poses are the most extreme points of a character's action will be. For example, when I squash down Akali as she lands down on the ground, the furthest down she goes will be an extreme pose. When she raises back up, the furthest up she gets will be an extreme pose as well. These poses allow you to know when an action in an animation is about to start or end. Breakdown poses act more like transitions between extreme poses. They form the curve or line of action the character will move in to get from one extreme pose to the next. For example, with Akali, the stretching between her first appearing high in the frame and her squashed on her landing will be a breakdown pose because it forms a line of action between one extreme and the other. There's also in-between poses which do exactly what they're named after. They're posed in between the breakdowns to further complete the animation. Understanding the hierarchy of key poses, extreme poses, breakdown poses, and then in-between poses allow you to work in a much more organized way when animating. Polishing the block out. Once you're done with putting all of your poses from keys to in-betweens, it's time to adjust the timing of your animation and tweaking how certain aspects of the animation will look like. It's also important to make sure that the IK and FK controls are toggled one frame apart in this stage to avoid weird animation artifacts when splining later on. But before getting into the next step, I would strongly recommend taking half a day or a full day off. An important and crucial step in animation is to take a break and look at your work with a fresh pair of eyes. Take as much time as you feel is right, but make sure you do take the time or else you might miss some mistakes you could have adjusted too late afterwards. Splining 
Splitting is when you select all of your keyframes, you press shortcut T in the timeline and change the interpolation mode to Bezier. Now Blender will interpolate between your poses on each and single frame and make the animation smoother. The problem though, is that despite Blender or any other 3D software for that matter being so advanced, it still requires the human touch to make the final and proper adjustments to ensure as smooth an animation as possible. The main workspace we'll be working in will be the graph editor, where you'll be manipulating the curves individually to get specific control of each bone. I won't get too deep with the graph editor because it deserves a video on its own, but there are already plenty of videos across YouTube that explain it really, really well. Long story short, the graph editor allows you to control each channel of a bone, rotation, translation, and scale on each individual axis, X, Y, or Z, or even sometimes W if you're rotating on with quaternions. It seems very complicated at first, but it is seriously much easier to learn than you think. One thing that is also important is to view the arcs of most of your bones like the torso and the limb movements so that they look pleasing and avoid jittery movements. To do that, click on the bone you want to see the arc for, and then go to the data properties on the left and click on motion paths. Click on calculate adjust the view settings to your liking and press OK. As you're adjusting the arc and making it smoother through the graph editor, click on update all paths to update the arc shape or just add them to your quick favorites menu like I did to do it much faster. Then, same as before with the end of the blocking stage, take the time to polish the final details of the animation such as fingers or facial features. Animating the camera. One piece of advice I would like to give is in regards to the camera itself. It's important not to forget that the camera is an invisible character in the scene and it does interact with the character you're animating. In the Akali exercise, the obvious example is the camera shake when she lands. It was planned from the beginning even, but later when splatting, I realized it was a little too static, so I added some zooms to emphasize some of Akali's movements. For example, when I zoom in slowly as she calls in for her blades and zoom back out quickly as they fly in and she catches them. These camera movements will accentuate what your character is doing and more clearly communicate what is happening to the audience. Final note. You'll notice I've done more with the scene like adding in the beam effect, made the rocks fly up in the air as she lands, and added some 2D drawn effects later in the after effects. I didn't record those as I worked on them, but I kind of wish I did now. All these elements obviously are part of the animation. In the future, I'll make sure to record those extra steps and further elaborate on them. As always, in the meantime, if you have any questions, leave them in the comment section and I'll get to them as fast as I can. Peace.